It's a Bible song. Gospel of Luke chapter 10, the parable of the lost sheep. What a gracious and loving God we serve. Drop anything and everything to draw us back, to bring us back to him. Through his loving arms. Have your Bibles. Turn with me to the gospel of, I think I said that because I was just talking about Luke. (laughs) Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 17 and the journey continues. We are right smack in the heart of the European journey. Unfortunately, at this time of Paul's life, they didn't have Eurorail passes, so he wasn't able to get around as quickly and as efficiently and as effectively as he could have, perhaps. But nonetheless, as we saw in chapter 16, as they make their way across the Aegean Sea from what is modern-day Turkey or Asia Minor into Europe, um, God has opened this tremendous door to reach the planet with the gospel, the good news, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We sit here today because of what we've been witnessing and what we've been reading about in the the book of Acts. This book being nothing more than God's plan, God's journey for us as individuals and also as a church as he begins to birth this very unique entity called the church church. We are called this morning a sent Bible church, which simply means an assembly of people. And we're not assembling for the sake of assembling. We are assembling here this morning so that we can know God's plan, his purpose in our lives, so we can head out those doors and accomplish the mission that he's given each and every one of us. So I pray that as we continue on this journey in the book of Acts together, that we wouldn't lose sight of why God saved you, or why he left you here after he saved your soul. He could have removed you and taken you from this planet immediately after he saved you. But no, he chose to leave you here because he's got a plan for you. He's got a purpose for you. And we're seeing these principles and these truths revealed to us in this amazing book called the book of Acts. And it's exactly what the book implies, the title. It's the Acts of the Apostles. But if you really delve down into the depths of the book... It's a lot of how God used the apostles, beginning with the original 12, leading with the apostle Paul. Now we've met Silas and Timothy and some other cool dudes. But it's really about the acts of the Holy Spirit of God. As he moves through Asia, through Europe, through Western Europe, through the United States, ultimately not in the book of Acts, and then ultimately to Santa Fe, New Mexico. I don't know if you know this or not, but Spain is also mentioned in the Bible. God had a plan for Spain, for the Iberian Peninsula, and we're testimony of that connection in this culture. So take your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 17. We're going to be hanging out in verses 16 through 34 this morning. I'm kind of going to give you a quick overview of a part of the chapter that we kind of skipped over last week because I wanted to give some of the people that were involved with what we did at the Nambe Pueblo to share a little bit of their testimony. So we're going to touch on that briefly this morning to not to ignore or to neglect a very key and strategic part of the story of the journey. We shared with you last week how Paul moved from Philippi, which was the staging area into Europe. This is a very key and strategic place. It was a military Roman colony. So It was very pagan in the sense that Rome had had a lot of influence in Philippi, but it was also very strategic in the sense that the Philippians were able to embrace and understand this this purpose and this mission that God had for them. So some 18 years later, Paul writes to the believers in Philippi that he had a chance of meeting as he as God led Paul from Turkey, Asia Minor, Acts chapter 16, into Philippi, which is right around here. Acts 16, 11 through 15. We know the significance of Philippi in the Bible. It's a church that understood that he embraced this whole concept of joy. It was a very profound and significant place because one of the things that God has in store for the body of Christ, for the church, this is why I'm referring to it as a launching pad, if you will. 
God desires for you and for me to experience joy in our lives. There's absolutely no reason why believers ought to live lives of defeat and discouragement and loss and patheticness because we serve a God that is all about living a joyous life, which leads us to the next church in our story. And we saw this last week, the church at Thessalonica. And this is where we left off, chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. Who can remind me what the name Thessalonica means? And its significance. Remember, if you remember, it sits at the base of Mount Olympus. Yes, the infamous Olympus, which is where the Olympics began. So these were a people that understood competition, that understood winning, that understood crowning. And the word Thessalonica or Thessalonian means what now? It means victory. That you and I could experience victory in this life, not by what anything you and I could do, but as we trust and depend on Christ more and more each and every day of our lives, there's no reason to live the life of a victim by the life of a victor through Jesus Christ. And that's what Thessalonica was about. So the story begins this morning with where we left off as Paul begins to continue his journey. And as you saw the title of our series this morning, we're going to look at how Paul ultimately makes his way to the hotbed, if you will, of paganism, or what we know today as Athens. Athens, and this is why we titled our sermon this morning, Up to Our Necks in Greece. He's there, man. He's there, and there's some crazy stuff going on in this very unique city. But until we get there, let me share with you a couple thoughts about this place that we find in our text in chapter number 17, known as Berea. We didn't look at these verses last week, but let me just go over them so we don't lose sight of its role and its significance as Paul moves and the Holy Spirit of God is moving them from Philippi to Thessalonica to Berea and then ultimately to Athens, which is where we're going to be camping out this morning. Look what is said here about Berea. Verse 10, and the brethren, and again, If you remember from last week, what was one of the significant things that came out of Thessalonica? What was one of the things that was said of the believers in Thessalonica as these these magistrates and these people showed up, these, uh, these anarchists, if you will, they showed up at the house of Jason. And something really profound was said of these folks, these believers in Thessalonica. Watch out for them. Why? Verse 6, <laughs> they're turning the world upside down. And wouldn't that be a cool thing to be said about us? Wouldn't that be awesome if this world would view this church as a church that is turning the world upside down? And because of that influence and because of their effectiveness in Thessalonica, Just like Paul tends to do, man, wherever he shows up, he causes a ruckus and he has to leave by the nighttime to escape persecution. Look what happens here in verse number 17 and verse 10. And the brethren immediately, they sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went unto the synagogue of the Jews. There was obviously a synagogue in Berea. And if you look at this map, let me just back up one screen real quick. Here's the little town of Berea, just some 60 miles from Thessalonica. And this is what is said about the Bereans here in verse number 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Wow, these were some brave souls in Berea. And what made them so profoundly significant in the Bible. Look what is said of them next. And that they received the word of God with all readiness of mind. Much like the Thessalonians and how they received God's word, not as the word of men as we saw last week in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, but they also were receptive and opened to God's word. In other words, they they were in tune with the God of Israel. All they needed was this New Testament apostle, this proclaimer of the gospel, Paul and Silas in this case, to enlighten them, to, to be allowed to be used by God to provide revelation. Look at the next verse. In that they receive the word of God with all readiness of mind and they search the scriptures daily. 
What made this, this church so unique in Berea? They were in the Word of God every single day. That's convicting a little bit, isn't it? For you and for me. Because when we spend time in God's Word each and every day, look what the outcome is. Look at the outcome. Whether those things, they search the Scriptures day, whether those things were so. These were a people that had so much wisdom and discernment because of their faithfulness and their commitment to God's word that they were able to filter all the craziness in a Greco-Roman world by God's word. One of the things that we talk about in our Bible study all the time and when we're teaching Bible study, when we emphasize becoming students of God's word, the whole purpose that we advocate, that we, why we disciple and why we do what we do in this church is so that you can be a discerner of the craziness and the nonsense that is going on in a Greco-Roman culture. And only through the word of God are we able to filter all that stuff. We often liken um, the word of God to a coffee filter. Man, could you imagine if we didn't have filters in our coffee pots? You would get all that black, ugly stuff that sticks to your teeth and gets into your gums into your body and I don't know what you guys grew up calling them but I knew them as kunkis you guys know the word kunkis Patsy does I don't like the way kunkis feel in my teeth grounds coffee grounds are kunkis for you non-nortenos here's what the word of God does for you it filters all the craziness and the nonsense in your life and this is what you see happening on with these Bereans look with me in verse 12 Therefore, many of them, they believed also of honorable women, which were Greeks and of men, not a few. So many of those Bereans who embraced God's word, who were able to know and learn God's word because they spent time in it daily and be able to filter the craziness in their world, came to accept and get to know the God of Israel, the God of the Bible and his plan and their purpose and his purpose for their lives And here's verse number 13 again. Paul always causing a ruckus. Says in verse 13, But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither also. And they stirred up the people, right? Whenever you see God moving, again, I'm going to bring to light again, the religious crowd or the religious folks or Satan will always counter. God moves, Satan counters, even in your life. Be mindful of that. Be aware of that. As we were preparing our teams to go minister to the kids in Nambay Pueblo with that Bible camp, I warned our people, be ready, man. As God moves, we're going to get some pushback by certain folks. And sure enough, it's already started. This is how this issue and the battle for souls plays out. And it says here in verse 14, and then immediately because of this this negative influence that started to make its way into, Thessalonica, from, into Berea from Thessalonica. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as it were to the sea. In other words, they kind of did this distraction thing. They told him, hey, Paul's over at the coast waiting to leave. And look what happens next. But Silas and Tim- Timotheus abode there still. A little bit of of a deceptive plan if you will and it says in verse 13 and they conducted paul and they brought them and they brought him everybody else stayed behind where unto athens unto athens and receiving a commandment unto silas and timotheus to come to him with all speed they departed so paul ends up in of all places the bastion of greek culture and greek philosophy in the city of athens hence where it is that we're hanging out today neck deep in greece so take your bibles we're going to begin here in verse number 16 all the way down to the end of the chapter verse 34 and we're going to unpack some really incredible and profound truths about how it is that you and i could respond to a postmodern world that has no concept of God anymore. This is what you find in the text. 
I would like everybody to just take your Bibles and turn with me to this very profound and significant verse in your Bible. Take your Bible and open it to the 118th Psalm. I don't know if you know this about your Bible, but there are some 31,102 verses in it. 31,102 verses from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22, verse 21. 31,102 verses. If you divide your Bible, and I'm looking right here at Eileen and Dominic, if you divide that Bible perfectly in half, you will get to the 118th Psalm in verse 8. And this is what the middle verse Or how the very middle verse of the Bible reads. And there's 15 words in this verse, by the way. And it says this. It is better to trust in the Lord than to what? Than to put confidence in man. You know, that is such an encouraging verse for me personally. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it fascinating that God would put those words as the heart of his word? He's saying to you and to me, trust me. I'll get you through this mess. I'll get you through this crazy journey. I don't care how neck deep you get in life. If you trust me, I'll see you through this thing. I'll get you through this mess. And that's where Paul found himself, frankly, as he makes his way into the bastion of Greek philosophy and Greek culture. Where, there was, where it was estimated in, during the days of antiquity, during the days of the Apostle Paul, there were some twenty-five to 30,000 gods or statues that they worshipped within the city of Athens alone. And Paul happens to show up to this place. And he says, in the words of David, the, the king, trust in him. Trust in him and him only. Put confidence in, he says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. No, that's not what he says. Somebody quote it to me again. Thank you. It is better. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. And you know what you find in the story? Paul living those words out to a T. Because man has a way to confuse, to deceive And use it within the context of philosophy and religion. Now you take those 15 words and you divide those 15 words in half, that verse in half. What do you get to? Two words, right? Guess what the two words, the heart of the Bible are? The Lord. Isn't that cool? The Lord. At the end of the day, that's all this is about. This thing is simply about the Lord and the fact that you and I are privileged to be a part of his kingdom, his family, his journey, his plan, and his purpose for our lives. This is all the book of Acts is. This is all the Bible is. The Bible is nothing more. And this is what I love, and I say this all the time. The book of Acts is a historical, it's a history account of the church. If you take that word history in you divide it in half, two syllables, it's his story. Did you know, folks, that the Holy Bible, that the book that we hold, that we're reading this morning, is the only holy book on all the planet that has a historical perspective or application to it? The Quran doesn't have that. The, the, um, the Hindu Vedas doesn't hold that. The Book of Mormon isn't a historical book. This book is Because God and history is nothing more than God bringing redemption and hope and purpose to a fallen creation, to a fallen world, and to fallen beings. That is the story of the Bible. So when Paul gets to Athens, when he finally shows up in Athens, he's neck deep in some crazy and bizarre stuff. And the first thing I want us to consider this morning in the few, first few verses that we're going to be looking at, verses um, 16 through 21, speak to us about a message to a modern man. How is it that we deal with a postmodern, 
post-Christian era. Whether you know it or not, whether you realize it or not, and some of us live in this Christian bubble, you are living in a time and in a period where we are seeing an entire generation that has no concept of God. How do we respond to that? Because again, I love Paul and who, how he embraces the wisdom in the Bible because Paul oftentimes, because of his mindset and his, the, way his, the way he thought and the way he thinks, had this true and this profound connection with the wisest man that ever lived in the Bible and that we know that is Solomon. Not the wisest man that ever just lived in the Bible, but the wisest man that ever lived, period. And Paul understood that. And Paul was able to, to trust in the Lord as he journeyed into this pagan, philosophical, backward, superstitious world in which he delved into when he made his way into Athens. Look how the story begins here in verse number 16. It says this in 17 and six, 17, verse 16. And now while Paul waited for them, for the rest of his missionary team, in other words, he's all alone at Athens. His spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Man, could you imagine? Here was a guy who grew up in Jerusalem, was born in Tarsus. All he knew was this Oriental, Asiatic culture, always around the scriptures, always around the Bible. And he makes his way, and I'm sure as he was growing up, and he was involved heavily in Greek culture. The Greek culture was dominant then. From the 3rd century BC all the way till the 1st century AD, Greek culture pre preminated everything. And frankly, we know when we are still living in that age or in that culture to this day because it was the foundation to Western civilization as you and I know it. This is why I always, whenever I'm teaching the Bible, I remind people that we are living in a Greco-Roman world and a Greco-Roman culture because this is where Western civilization, as we know it today, began. So this is what he's dealing with. This is what he's confronting. This is what he's seeing. And I, I'm sure being Paul and, and being this, this bookworm, this student, not just of the word, but also of history and of cultures, couldn't wait to get to Athens to see and to embrace and consider the greatness of this city. And he shows up and he's just blown away with what he's witnessing. I had a similar experience a few years ago when we went to Jerusalem. I'll never forget, we got there in the evening. It was already dark. We checked into the hotel and I told Larry, I couldn't wait to go into the whole city. I said, you know what? You stay home. So you stay in the hotel. I'm just going to go check things out and She's really concerned. I said, don't worry about me. I look like a Muslim. I look like an Arab. I'll be okay. I'll be just fine. <laughs> Knowing that we were in the Muslim quarter of the old city, I went in through the Damascus Gate, and I had no idea where I was. But all I was able to witness and observe was this incredible city, which is called the City of David, the City of Peace, and divided into four quarters based on religion. There's the Armenian quarter, the Christian quarter, the Jewish quarter, and the Muslim quarter. Dividing the old city into four quarters because of religion. And I remember thinking and how heartbreaking it was knowing and realizing that there was a God that God shed that gave his only precious son to die for everybody in the old city so that they could become one in him. How heartbreaking it was. And then the next day we got in the bus and we were heading out towards the Dead Sea. And I'll never forget as we were dro driving up on that upper hill as we looked down into the city of Jerusalem. And I saw for the first time physically and literally the Dome of the Rock. And I said, wow, that is the holy place. That is where the third temple is going to reside. And just knowing and realizing that right now today a mosque or two mosques sit on that holy place. Holy to the Jews, holy to the world when the king of glory comes back. And thinking to myself, what a crazy world we live in. Two weeks ago, after we took the folks, the, the, Ohio, uh, the Ohio team stuck, stuck around, they stuck around? 
Yeah, that. They stuck around <laughs> an extra day on Saturday. And we went to Bandelier and we made our way back to Santa Fe. And I was giving them a little tour. We took them to the Cross of the Martyrs. And I said, man, look at this place. Isn't this a beautiful city? I was bragging on my city. I love this place. Don't you love this place? I dig it. And then we made our way down into the city, into the plaza. And little did I know that it was gray gay pride day. <laughs> so here I have all these folks from Michigan. And we go into Starbucks to get a cup of coffee. And it broke my heart to see 10 and 11 and 12 year old kids embracing that lifestyle. Not even knowing who they are and what they believe. And one of the couples or one of the ladies that was in our group asked me, man, doesn't this like turn you off? And he goes, I love this city. But yeah, I'm broken for the idolatry and for the philosophy that is so permeating our culture. Because look at the next verse in our text. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred up in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore, disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons that in the market daily with them that met with him. In other words, these people wanted nothing more than to confront and to call him out on his message. The proclamation of the gospel that Jesus Christ died for everyone. And look what happens here next in verse 18. Then certain, what were they? Philosophers. Philosophy. The heart of Greek culture in Athens. And certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics. And they encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? That word babbler simply means a seed picker. In other words, who is this Paul who just goes around the world picking seeds here and there and trying to implant them into our minds and into our heads, questioning and denying and rejecting his message, which was a really cool message. What is the message? Look at this. So what does the Bible say? Of some, for seemeth to be a, a, a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them what? Jesus and the resurrection. He always stayed true to the message. He always stayed true to the gospel. And these guys, these Epicureans and these Stoics philosophers, those were the two main philosophies of ancient Greece at the time. And I want you to know that those two philosophies exist even to this day. The Epicureans were, was a philosophy founded about 317 BC by a really profound philosopher by the name of, yes, Epicurus. <laughs> And you know, what, you know what Epicurism teaches? You know what Epicurism is about? It's a hedonistic philosophy. That eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you're going to die. Live for now. Another term that we've given Epicurism today is nihilism. Enjoy life to its fullest because you know what? You're just existing for the now. In other words, let your flesh and let pleasure drive who you are. That's the only way you'll find happiness is through pleasure of the flesh. That was what they believed. That is what they taught. And as we made our way through the plaza last week, man, that's Epicurism at its, at its finest. All about the flesh. The infamous British playwright Oscar Wilde, who was the epitome of hedonism, lived by this adage, I can resist everything except temptation. That's what he lived by. Famous guys had literally, I don't know if this is the appropriate term, but the a harem of young boys around him always, a pedophile. And at his deathbed, as he called his long-life boyfriend, Robbie, um, I got his name here, Robbie Ross to him as he was dying of syphilis. As he lay in his bed dying, he looked to his boyfriend, Robbie Ross, and he said, Robbie, did you ever, ever love any of these boys that you had your way with? And he said, absolutely not. Just like you, I believe only in pleasure. And you know what he said next to his boyfriend, Robbie Ross? 
get me a pastor. Knowing and realizing that there had to be more than life than just physical pleasure. That's Epicurism. There's another group that shows up, right? The Stoics. Does that name ring of all that term? These were the self-righteous, disciplined dudes. The Stoics. Founded by a guy by the name of Zero Zeno of Cyprus. That's where we get the term, this guy has a stoic, disciplined demeanor or countenance. No emotion, no nothing. And they use this self-discipline. But isn't it interesting that these toothless philosophies align themselves against the truth, against Paul? But here's an adage, and here's a thought to consider. That throughout history and throughout, as you consider the condition of the human condition, this always plays out that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So the gospel, Paul was the true enemy, but the Stoics and the Epicureans who were on opposite ends of the, of the flesh cycle, if you will, of the discipline cycle, these guys were complete reprobates, the Epicureans. These other guys were disciplined and thought that we could overcome any temptation by this mental thing, by self-control. They come together to counter anything and everything that the Apostle Paul is trying to reveal to them. And look what is said of them. Paul, in his dealing with them, Paul deals with them in a really profound way. And the reason why he was able to confront these guys the way he did, and this is why you see this message to this postmodern culture in a profound way, because this guy, this guy Paul, he understood philosophy better than the philosopher themselves. How can we say that? You hold in your hand, in the Old Testament, this tiny little book written by the wisest man that'll ever live, by the name, a guy by the name of Solomon, wrote the most philosophical book that you'll ever read anywhere on the planet. It's known as the book of Ecclesiastes. And let me share with you how Solomon closes that book, how he brings to light in the most profound philosophical piece of literature you'll ever read, the book of Ecclesiastes. Listen to what he says in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. In other words, when all is said and done, he says, fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man reverence him know him love him be obedient to his plan and his purpose for your life and watch him watch him transform you watch him take you to another place and another level he'll take you places you never imagined and it says in verse number 14 for god shall bring every work into judgment Every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. That's how Ecclesiastes ends. Written by none other than the wisest man in the history of mankind. Other than the Lord Jesus Christ, Solomon. So look down with me now in verses 19 through 21 as we see how Paul dealt with a people that had heard only what they wanted to hear. This is what the whole idea of Athens was about. In other words, they would gather just to glean from each other and just get bigger and brighter heads. Tell me we don't live there today. This is why everybody and their mother writes a book today. So they can go on a book tour and get on the talk shows and show off what they know or in most cases what they don't know. Because the only thing that matters in life is reverence him and be obedient to his plan and his purpose for your life. Look what is said here in verse 19 through 21. And they, and they took him, they took Paul, and they brought him up to the Aragabus. This was this, this mound of rock on the northwest part of the Acropolis. If we were looking at the Acropolis where the Parthenon sits, I've had the privilege of being there. Larry and I saw the, 
the Mars Hill where Paul actually stood and preached the most incredible um, sermon to lost people that you'll ever find in the Bible, which we're going to see in a minute. They take him up there, and this is where they would hang out to kind of try to glean wisdom from each other. Look what it says here in verse numbers 19 through 21. And they took him and they brought him to the Acropolis saying, may we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? Teach it to us. What's this Jesus thing about, in other words? This resurrection thing. What are you really getting at, Paul? And they, verse number 20, for thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We've never heard this. We would know therefore what these things mean. Verse 21, I love this. Holy Spirit stuck this verse right smack in the middle of the text in parentheses. What was their real motive? What was, again, this is why he sticks it in there. You, were they really sincere and genuine about knowing Jesus and his resurre- knowing about his resurrection? Look what it said of them here in verse 21. For all, not just some of them, but all of them, but all the Athenians and strangers which were there, they spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. There's their motive. Enlighten me. Reveal to me. Let's philosophize, never really concerning themselves with eternal things, purpose, and why God created them, and why God existed, and why God did what he did. Which brings us to the next point or the next principle which is Paul's message on the infamous Mars Hill. The Oropagus sat on top of Mars Hill. It was kind of like their little coffee shop area, if you will. You ever go to coffee shops, hang out at coffee shops? You can solve all the world's problems. Right, Isaac? You and I have solved how many world's problems over a cup of coffee? That's what they were doing in Athens. They would hang up on this, this rock, looking over the city, Sharing all these cool thoughts and ideas. Why do birds fly? Why is water wet? That's philosophy. Circular reasoning. Never coming to the conclusion of the whole matter. Love him, reverence him, live for him. And watch him rock your world. So Paul, now he brings this message at Mars Hill. It says here in verse number 22, then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are way too superstitious. Even the Epicureans who were agnostic or even atheist to some degree, everybody, everybody believes in something. And if you're not going to believe in something, if you're not going to stand for something, somebody else you know, somebody will show up in your life or somewhere at some point in your journey that will deceive you to get to believe some craziness. During the time that we were preparing for the camp, there was a huge gathering of people from all of northern New Mexico, southern Colorado, who knows where they were from, at the Buffalo Thunder to listen to, not even to listen to her because she doesn't really speak, to Ama. yes. A Hindu deity goddess woman who makes her way up to northern New Mexico once a year at Buffalo Thunder. You know what she does? She gives people hugs. That's all she does. And I've been to one of her meetings because I had to deal with a guy that was an Ama follower. I said, if I go to your meeting, and this is several years ago, will you come to church? (laughs) And I did. And I was blown away because as she made her way into the room, people fell on their faces weeping and crying over this woman. And I thought to myself, man, my church has never done that for me. <laughs> I was... I make... T- no, but do you see how... Do you see how we can be deceived, be deceived how we can be led into some crazy stuff? I was in India few years ago charlie romero and i we went to kerala which is this town on the coast that this lady is from there's billboards and signs of her everywhere and and i asked him and i asked i asked um pastor uh, um 
Dez, Dez was his name. I said, so what are your thoughts of this woman? Because she's got a lot of influence where I live. And she goes, you know what he says to me? She's demon possessed. Those were his words. Those were my words. I said, okay. I left it at that. And I never went back to another Amma meeting. But this is what Paul is dealing with a superstitious people who are all about religion and trying to make God and put God in a box. Isn't that what religious people do? You make God whatever you want to make him. And look at how Paul deals with the issue here in verse 22, verse 23. Then as I passed by and I beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription. And mind you, there were 25 to 30,000 gods scattered throughout Athens. And this is all... Paul found in that city, to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. And you know what Paul begins to do now in verses 22 and 23 on? He begins to provide this incredible sermon about the one and only true God. So in verses 24 to 25, you see Paul using the familiar to introduce the unfamiliar. I was meeting with a young man and when we were feeding the homeless several years ago over on Alameda Street. What is that place called on Alameda Street? Um, Salvation Army. We were feeding the homeless and there were a, a group of kids that came down from St. John's College and two of, them was agno- two of them were agnostic, one of them was atheist and one of them was kind of a fallen away Jewish kid. And I'll never forget, he asked me, what do you, what does your church believe? Or talk to me about this Christianity thing. And he was pretty oblivious. He knew some things about the Bible because he has a brother that lives in Israel who is a, who is a rabbi. And we had this really awesome discussion. And at the end of discussion, I never really had the privilege of giving him the gospel. But I said to him, Stephen, make this your one request to God. Make this your one prayer. Whether you know him like you think you ought to know him or not. But let, ask this one heart's prayer to him. Ask him to reveal himself to you. Make that your prayer. Keep it that simple. I have no idea where that young man is today, but that is a charge for each and every one of us in this room. Think about your life, your history as you've gone through life. Thinking of these deep things, these things that matter. Desiring to matter in this life, to have a purpose in this life. You have a God that has explicitly and clearly provided that path, that journey for you. Just trust him, love him, depend on him, reverence him. And this is what Paul begins to do in this text, in this passage. Look at verse 24. He says, know this about God, that God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth and dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Isn't that a natural tendency of religious people? It's to build a building, build a structure, go worship that building. It's exactly what we see going on with Jewish people even to this day at the Western Wall where you serve a God who is a spirit and those that worship him. He said to the Samaritan woman in John 4, we'll worship him in spirit and in truth. True worshipers. And this is what Paul begins to drive home that we serve, that the God that you you worship, the gods that you worship... The real and true God is the creator of the universe. He is the creator. You can't go one verse in the Bible, Genesis 1-1, without his creative nature being identified and expounded on. It says in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. 23 times you'll find the word God in Genesis one in some form, just the word God. You know what the word God translates to in Hebrew in that, in that chapter? The word Elohim, the creator, the God of all creation. I don't know about you guys, man, but we live in a very, very cool place when it comes to embracing his creative nature. Just go and look at the night sky tonight sometime and see his, his, his glory The psalmist wrote about the stars and the universe declaring the glory of God. Take your Bibles and turn with me to Genesis chapter 2 because I want to share with you the next term or title that you see given to God in the text. 
It says this in Genesis chapter 2. This is as soon as he's done setting up this incredible framework, this structure called the universe with planet Earth included. He now drills down and identifies this piece of geography that we know today as the Fertile Crescent or also in the Bible known as the Garden of Eden. And look what it says here in verse number 5. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were what? They were created in the day that the who created them. Get the text right. What does it say? The Lord God. The Lord God. First time you find the word Lord in scripture. Never in Genesis 1 because he's all Elohim in verse one, chapter 1. But here in chapter 2, now he's going to begin becoming the provider. Look at the next verse. It said, look at verse 7. And the Lord God, not just God, not just Elohim, but the Lord God formed man in the midst of the ground. And he breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a what? A living soul. The Lord God breathed into you and you became a living soul. So you weren't just a creation. He had a purpose for you. And they'll go back to our text back in... Uh, back in uh, Acts chapter 17, because look at the next part of the verse here in verse 24. And God made the world, there's Elohim, and all things therein, seeing that he is the, what? The Lord of heaven and earth. You know what he wants to do? He wants to be Lord of your life. He wants to know that he could breathe life into you, that you matter to him, that he cares for you, that he loves you, that he's not this disconnected God that most religions teach about. Paul and his only prayer and his only desire in the book of Philippians chapter 3 he says man I just want one thing in life I just want to know him how can you trust someone that you don't know remember the verse 118 Psalm verse 8 trust no it is better to trust in the Lord how can you trust a God you don't even know look at the next verse not only was he presented as the creator and as the provider of life, Paul presents him in verses 26 and 27 as a personal God. It says this in 26. And God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and had determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. He says in that verse, man, that his shed blood on that cross covered the sins of all mankind. What I love about God and the God of the Bible, he transcends, he transcends religion, he transcends race, he transcends culture. You know what he says of us? That you're all one big happily family in me because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And he says, man, you serve a God that has shed his blood for you, that wants to include you, listen to this, into his family, to make you a part of his plan, his purpose, and his journey in our lives. So Paul presents him as the redeemer. He pre presents him as a sovereign God where he talks in the text in this verse about God orchestrating timing and events. Remember we talked about that a few weeks ago? It's no coincidence that he put you in this place at this time. Remember the book of Esther, Esther chapter 4, verse 11, I believe it is, when God called Esther out and he says, man, God put you in this place. God is using you in this journey to bring hope and restoration to these captive people that are in Babylon for such a time as this. He didn't stick you guys back in the turn of the century. He put you here for a period, for a time and now, for a purpose. I wake up every single day and I'm grateful for where I live, not just because of its beauty, but because of the, the awesomeness of the freedoms that we get to live in this country. And I didn't end up in Bangladesh. Not that Bangladesh is bad, but I wouldn't want to live there. Maybe some of you would. But man, I'm so grateful for where I live and in the time I live in. And that's what, that's what he's trying to drive home. That we're dealing with a personal God that cares about your everyday. Man, he knows the hairs on your head. 
And on some of you, it's a lot easier to count than others. And I realize that. Look at the next verse. He's a God in verse 27. I love this. That is accessible. That they should seek the Lord. If haply they might feel after him and find him. Though he not be far from every one of us. He's telling these guys that had no concept of God. Who were stuck in their Epicurean selfish pleasures philosophy. Or this stoic self-centered self-help mentality. That you serve a God that understands your pain, your suffering. That desires to comfort you, to know you. And he bids us to come. Come therefore boldly unto the throne of grace. Come unto me all ye that are burdened and heavy laden. The Bible says, Jesus says, and I shall give you what? Rest. Isn't rest a good thing? Spiritual, man. He wanted these guys to know Jesus. And in verses 28 and 29, Paul presents God as the sustainer of life. Look, we hear in 28. For in him, for in him, we live. That's what the resurrection is about. He wants you to live a life of purpose. Jesus has promised to you and to me is a life that is fulfilling. The thief, he says, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come to give you life. And a life more abundantly. He's the giver of life. It was when he breathed into Adam in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. Where he was referred to as Lord God. To bring forth life. To an empty shell of a man. For we live and we move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. And in that verse, he's quoting some ancient poets. A guy by the name of Erastus who looked at Zeus as the giver of life. Zeus was nothing more than a Greek philosophical view of the creator God. And in verse 30, Paul communicates God's purpose. You need to get this, folks, because this is the key to life. Look at verse 30. And the times of this ignorance, God winked at. In other words, he's showing grace towards a people that had no concept of who he was. Do you remember all the days that he showed grace towards you as he waited for you to receive him, to accept him? As you were seeking him and, and, and you sought him out in your heart. He says, I'm going to lead them places. I'm going to take this person a place so I could reveal myself to him. And you know what? During that journey, God's, he's winking. But look why. Look what happens. Look what his expectation of us is. But now he commandeth all men everywhere to what? To repent. To come to him. To change. You don't have to live in the gutter. You don't have to live the life of a victim. You can live the life of the victor because everything that Paul just laid out for you and for me. Because the last principle that I want us to be mindful of is this whole idea that Paul's message also is for the masses. And in verses 31 through 34, you find and you see a warning, a very dire warning. And it's a futuristic warning, but nonetheless... It's inevitable. Those of you that have been joining me on Bible study as we look at these timelines, you know that there's a day of reckoning coming. God is a righteous judge. And if you think this world is going to continue to do what it does, you're, you're living with your head in the sand, man. Lift up your heads, he says. Walk circumspectly. He says, redeem the time. And in Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 17 or 18, why? Because the days are evil. He says to the Ephesians, make up for lost time. So what? You've screwed up all your life. Don't be there. Don't stay there. And he says this in verse number 32, 31, because why should we look to him? Why should we go to him? Why should we repent? Repent means to change your mind, change your thoughts, move from philosophy, move from your religious mindsets and attitudes to the one and only true God. 
He says this in verse 31, because this is why he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. This is why it's a message for the masses because everybody will give an account either at the judgment seat of Christ or at the great, great white throne. You pick, you choose two different judgments, one for the saved, one for the lost. There's only two types of people on the planet. I don't care what race you call yourself. You either know Jesus or you don't. And he says this, because he hath appointed a day in which we will, he will judge the world in righteousness by that man who hath, he, by that man whom he hath ordained. Who did he ordain? His holy and his precious son. Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men and that he hath raised him from the dead. There it is again, man. You can't get away from the resurrection because that is the only thing that will give you purpose and hope and a reason to live. And look what happens next. Verse 32, and when they, who were they? All the Athenians hanging out on Mars Hill, taking it all in, sipping their espresso, giving their opinion. And when they had heard of the resurrection of the dead, what did some of them do? They mocked. Some mocked, and others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. Some mock, some people will be out there and they'll just flat out reject God's plan, God's purpose. It's a choice, man. God will never, ever force you to follow him. God will never, ever, if, if, if he wanted that, if he created us to be like that, he could have just made a bunch of robots. But no, he gave you a thing called free will. And that is the cool thing about God. And this is why the last things that... that, that Moses says to the children of Israel as they're entering the promised land, he says to them, choose this day. Blessing or cursing, life or death, but you choose. It's a choice. And some people to this day will mock and choose to reject eternity, life, purpose, and this is why we have an entire people group, an entire generation with, that, are in, that is infested with drugs and alcohol and anything and everything to, to fill that void, that God-shaped void in each and every one of us that only he can fill. And so mocked. And what did the, this other group do? Look at verse 32. And we will hear this again of this matter. You know what these guys did? Like some of us have done in our lives, kick the can down the road. Let me think about it. Well, guess what, folks? There isn't a person in this room guaranteed tomorrow. You're not. I don't mean to freak you out or scare you, but that's, that's a fact. Any one of us could leave this planet today. This is why he said to the penitent thief on the cross in the Gospel of Luke 23, today, today, is the day of salvation. Don't kick the can down the road because look what happens next. Look at verse 33. This is crazy. So Paul departed from among them. I'm done. No more revelation. My advice to Stephen a few years ago, man, just pray, just beg God to reveal himself to you. And if you reject that revelation, guess what? God doesn't owe you any more revelation. And the messenger will leave but look at verse 34. This is so cool. Because although some mocked, some postponed, look at this next group. How be it certain men clave unto him. In other words, that word cleave means, man, they were hanging on to his every word. They became one with his words, with his sermon, with his message. And look at this. How be it certain men clave unto him. And they believed among the which were Dion Dion Dionysus's. An Aragopite and a woman named Damaris. All these cool Greek names. And others with them. You know what I love about this verse? When you come to know Christ, when you believe, he calls you by name. He knows your name. He knows you. 
You're his. Your name is now, your name, the Bible says, is now written in the Lamb's book of life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. Lord Jesus, we are in awe of how you work and how you worked in the early church. And Lord, thank you for the lessons that we learn in dealing with people, Lord God. People that are even in our midst to this day, the Epicureans and the Stoics and the philosophers, Lord, the desire to do nothing more than to rationalize you away. And I pray, Lord God, that you would use us, that we would embrace this powerful and this incredible story, the story of hope, a story, Lord God, that was provided to each and every one of us to include us, Lord God, in your plan and your purpose for our lives, a life worth living, a journey of a lifetime. Be with us now, Lord, and we'll give you, Lord Jesus, thanks and praise. Amen.